This is for the ethics review class at Parker University. Signing an office space lease can be a very intimidating experience. The lease may be a very lengthy, often is a very lengthy document. It is almost always very one-sided. The lease is designed to protect the landlord, not to protect the tenant. And I think many times small business owners sign leases without being aware of what's in the lease and without being aware of some of the things they may be able to negotiate, even if they have very limited negotiating power. So first, some of the clauses you need to be aware of. Uh, first one is the Americans with Disabilities Act in compliance with that act. Uh, generally, the ADA, well, it includes a number of requirements, but one of the requirements of the ADA is that places of public accommodation, businesses that are open to the public, should be accessible to people who are disabled. If the landlord has already constructed the space, then the landlord should be responsible for providing that that space is already in compliance with the ADA. Bringing a space into compliance with the ADA, uh, for example, putting in wider doors for wheelchairs or putting in a restroom that provides for better handicap access can be a very expensive proposition. So unless the tenant is doing renovations, the tenant may want to spell out or, or make sure that they either the space is compliant with the ADA or that it's the landlord's responsibility to bring the space into compliance. Uh, default. Uh, often one of the most frightening and lengthiest sections in a lease agreement has to do with what happens if the tenant doesn't do what they're supposed to do. A couple things you might want to look for. One is if there's a violation, will you receive a notice as the tenant that you have a right to cure? So for example, if you miss a payment, does that mean you can be evicted immediately? Or does that mean you will receive a letter saying you've got five days or some time period to fix the problem? Uh, now certainly pay your rent on time is the best practice, but there are sometimes some issues that can come up that may need some little, little bit of time to fix acceleration of rent. Typically when the tenant defaults on a lease, the lease is for a number of years, all that rent may become due and payable effective immediately. The problem with the acceleration of rent is it makes it almost impossible for the tenant to cure the default if that occurs. Uh, lockout. There are a number of state statutes. Texas is fairly restrictive about locking a tenant out of a residence but there's very little protection for locking a business out of a business place. So landlords in commercial leases are often much more aggressive about changing the locks uh, and, and excluding you from your space. Be sure you pay attention to what that clause is and understand what those rules are. Uh, mitigation is something to look for as well. Typically the landlord has a legal obligation if the tenant has broken a lease, tenant has abandoned the space or is not paying the rent, the landlord has an obligation to mitigate their damages by taking reasonable steps to find a new tenant. Many times I've seen leases where the landlord tries to put a clause in the lease that says they don't have that obligation. And the courts have been pretty clear in Texas that they do in fact have that obligation even if that clause is in the lease. But I think it's a good idea to ask that it be struck anyway if you see it in there. One provision will generally say the written document is the entire agreement between the parties. And the reason I bring that to your attention is sometimes leasing agents will exaggerate or talk freely about what benefits or the value of the space. Uh, but if it's not part of the written agreement, that may not be something that's enforceable down the road. So if there's a promise that's been made that's important or a key part of your decision to lease a space, be sure that promise is actually in the written document. Uh, holdover penalty. Uh, typical residential lease uh, or apartment lease may provide that if you hold over after the end of the lease, it simply becomes a month to month lease. But commercial leases can be different. If you hold over after the end of the lease, you often are subjected to a much higher uh, uh, rent. Rent may go up to one and a half or two times the ordinary rent. And you may also create a situation where you renew the lease automatically 
by holding over and renew it for that same period. So if you sign a five-year lease and you stay over for five years in one month, you may now find yourself with a 10-year lease with a much higher rent. So be careful about what those holdover penalties or holdover clauses are. Make sure you understand what they are as you're getting ready to move out and move out on time if that's going to be important. Uh, landlord's lien. Generally, the landlord's going to have a lien on everything in your premises. If you fail to pay the rent, they're going to have the right to seize all your furniture and equipment and sell that uh, to help uh, uh, pay your rent. Uh, leasehold improvements. Who's responsible for making them? Uh, one other problem with leasehold improvements is some landlords will allow you to only use specific contractors. Usually those contractors are not the best bargain and may not be the best quality work. So watch for those kinds of clauses and that may be something to watch to, to stay away from. Uh, Merchants Association. Some shopping centers have a Merchants Association, which is essentially like a homeowners association. But the goal of the Merchants Association is to pool money from the, the tenants in the commercial establishment to help promote that particular shopping center or to help sponsor activities in that particular area. Uh, my experience is that Merchants Association is of very little value, if any value, to a professional practice. If you see a Merchants Association in there, you may want to ask about whether it can be removed or you can be excluded from it. That may or may not be an option depending upon the landlord's agreement with the Merchants Association. If it is something you're going to have to agree to, be aware that you will have to pay dues uh, and that those dues may vary depending upon the decisions by the Merchants Association. Uh, Non-recourse against the landlord. Uh, typically, the lease agreement says that the landlord is not personally responsible if the landlord were to breach the agreement. So if something were to really go wrong and there is a particular problem with the lease, you may not have any real recourse against uh, the landlord. You may have a remedy against the property. Uh, people in real estate business often are highly leveraged. So when you go to re uh, enforce your rights against the property, you may find that there's very little, if any, equity in it. Not always the case, but sometimes the case. But the key here is just to understand your rights against the landlord are going to be very, very limited. In addition to the monthly rent, uh, the rent may also have some additional charges for the operating cost, sometimes referred to as a triple net cost. Essentially, the landlord is taking some of the expenses, like taxes, insurance, maintenance of the building or common area maintenance and passing those expenses on to the tenant on a pro rata basis based on the square footage. Uh, you can sometimes negotiate a cap to those expenses. Uh, it's always a good idea if you aren't sure what those expenses are to ask the landlord for some history of what the expenses have been over the last year or two so you can expect or budget for those expenses as part of your rent payment. Uh, security deposit works pretty much like any security deposit you've ever made. Uh, you pay the money to the landlord. Uh, if you happen to return the space in spotless condition, you might receive your money back. Otherwise, that security deposit is going to be used to repair or improve the space. Uh, services and utilities. In a residential area, the lease has to include all the typical utilities. But in a commercial lease, Many commercial leases do not include all the utilities. So for example, the space may have electricity, but the space may not have access to water and sewer, may not have access to natural gas. If you rent that space and need those services, it may be very expensive to extend those utilities to your space if it's even allowed or permissible. So think about the services that you need Sometimes a doctor's office is required to have a, a, their, a restroom, or sometimes a doctor's office may need plumbing to process uh, x-ray film. Uh, those services aren't necessarily there. Uh, check also for the electricity needs. If you don't have any unusual electricity needs, that shouldn't be a, a difficult problem to address. But if you have unusual electricity needs, like an x-ray machine, 
you may need to have some additional electrical service run to the space, which again can be an expensive proposition. The subordination, non-disturbance, and atonement clause essentially says if the landlord has a lease, the rights of the mortgage holder take priority over the rights of the tenant. So if for some reason the mortgage holder forecloses, the mortgage holder has the opportunity to uh, uh, evict the tenants. If they want to clear the space and use it for something other than a rental space, they may do that. If they're not satisfied or not happy with the mix of tenants, they can certainly come in and, and uh, evict tenants and terminate the lease agreement uh, for those tenants uh, that they want to get rid of. Uh, trade fixtures. Generally in a commercial lease, uh, any trade fixtures that are installed by the tenant can be taken by the tenant. If you intend to take anything of particular value, like an x-ray machine, that's going to be attached to the premises, I always think it's a good idea to spell out that that is one of these trade fixtures that will belong to the tenant. Otherwise, fixtures that are attached to the premises become property of the landlord. So for example, if you renovate a space by adding uh, cabinets and cupboards, those cabinets and cupboards will become property of the landlord when, you, when your lease ends. Uh, use of the common areas. Sometimes when you're leasing in an office space, the common areas are not open during the hours that a chiropractor may want to practice. A uh, typical office space may close at 6 p.m. But a chiropractor may want to be seeing patients until 7 or 8 p.m. so the patients can come by after work. Typical office space may not be open on the weekends, but a chiropractor may want to see patients on Saturdays when, again, when they can come in without missing work. Uh, pay attention to any limitations on your use of the common areas uh, and make sure it's going to be consistent with the way you want to run your practice. If it's not consistent, ask that it be changed in the lease agreement. And if it can't be changed, then that's probably not the space for you to rent. Some other things you may want to think about or try to negotiate with the landlord. Uh, first one is anchor stores. Sometimes the value of a lease has to do with the stores around it. So for example, a space that's in the same area as a grocery store may have a lot of traffic coming by it. And that traffic may be of particular value to a chiropractic practice. If that's part of the lease agreement, it's a good idea to include a clause in the lease agreement that says if something happens that the anchor store closes or leaves, then either the uh, smaller space has a right to terminate the lease or the value or the amount of rent will go down. Uh, otherwise, what happens is sometimes these, these anchor stores will close, and even though the value of the lease you just signed has gone way down, you're still stuck paying rent at the top of the market value for the next five years, or whatever's left in your five-year lease agreement. And that's not a good situation to put yourself in. Uh, so if that anchor store is there and it's important to the value, now often they have, the landlord will have a long-term lease with the anchor store, so they're more than happy to negotiate that kind of clause with you because they don't have much fear that the anchor store will close. Assignment and subleasing. Typical lease agreement absolutely prohibits the tenant from assigning the lease or subleasing the space. If part of your, your practice plan is to sublease space to perhaps massage therapists or other chiropractors, that's going to be a problem. So you want to negotiate to either remove that clause or to amend it so that you have the right to sublease the space or to amend it so that you have the right to sublease permission or sublease the space with the landlord's permission, which will not be unreasonably withheld. That gives the option to the landlord to, to say that's not an appropriate sublease, which is typically something they want. Um, commencement date. When does the lease start? Uh, usually the lease will have a starting date, but if the space is under construction or renovation, as a tenant you need to understand that if the landlord misses that date, it doesn't invalidate the lease, 
it simply postpones the commencement date. So if you need to move from one space to another and you need to be moved by a particular date, you want to make give that commencement date some teeth. You want to impose some kind of uh, uh, damages on the landlord. If the space is not ready on the commencement date, the lease needs to provide that the landlord will pay the tenant something. Now, if the landlord has to pay the tenant something, they can usually figure out a way to get the space ready on time. Otherwise, you find yourself in a situation where you have to leave uh, one office where your practice is located, and you may not be able to relocate for perhaps a month or two. Uh, condition of the premises. Uh, every lease agreement that I've ever seen says the tenant is accepting the condition of the premises as is. Uh, before you sign the lease agreement, you need to at least conduct a cursory inspection of the premises. Uh, depending on the amount of space you're leasing, you may very well want to hire a professional inspector to check it. Check things like the electricity. Make sure all the electrical outlets work. Make sure the lights work. Make sure the plumbing works the way it's supposed to work. Make sure there's no leaks. Uh, check things like the ceiling tiles. Uh, sometimes if there's been a roof leak, the ceiling tiles may be damaged and may need to be replaced. Make sure they get replaced before you sign the lease agreement or provide a, include a provision on the lease agreement that the landlords agreed to make those repairs or replacements. Exclusivity. Depending on the nature of the space you're moving into, a tenant can sometimes negotiate that they will ha have the exclusive rights. So, for example, if you're moving into a typical office building or a strip shopping center, uh, chiropractors can often negotiate that they will be the only chiropractic clinic in that space. Uh, landlords are usually more than willing to negotiate those clauses. They almost never offer it to you. So it's something, if it's appropriate for the space, then that's something you should ask for and negotiate with the landlord. Uh, personal guarantees. Uh, landlords have learned over the years uh, that it's very easy for a tenant to create a corporation or an LLC, put no assets in it, sign a lease agreement in that corporation's name, and then walk away without paying the landlord. Uh, landlords have learned from being burned that they need to protect themselves by getting a personal guarantee from the owner of the uh, business entity. And usually landlords are going to insist on a personal guarantee. In my experience, is they're not going to negotiate out of that unless the business is a substantial business that has an established credit record. But sometimes what you can do even as a small business is to negotiate with the landlord to have the guarantee expire. Uh, after the business entity has established its credit worthiness by paying rent on time for a certain period of years, uh, perhaps half the term of the lease, then once that occurs, the, the personal guarantee expires and the, the individual is released from that personal liability. Sometimes you can negotiate that, sometimes you can't, uh, but it's always, I think, often a good idea to at least ask. Watch for leases that require payment of a percentage of your income. Depending on the state that you're in, paying that kind of rent can be a violation of the fee splitting statutes in the state. It could be perceived or could be a potential kickback problem as well. Uh, in a typical uh, commercial lease, a retail lease, it is often part of the lease that part of the rent is a percentage of the income uh, earned at that location. Um, because it's not unusual in retail space, Landlords will often use the same form, even though they're leasing to a professional practice, like a chiropractic practice. If you see those percentage rent terms in your lease agreement, you should ask to remove them. Uh, typically, it's for your kind of practice, that should not be a problem. Um, if, it is if the landlord is going to insist on including it, be sure it's included in a way that's not going to violate any of the state's laws and be sure that you budget that as part of your, your space or part of your expenses. Uh, relocation clauses. Almost every landlord includes a clause that says if they want to move the tenant from one space to another, the landlord can do that at the landlord's expense. Uh, 
Now, in some situations, that may not be a problem. Moving from one end of a strip mall to another end may not be too much of an issue. But some strip malls are, are built in such a way that, that some spaces may be exposed to the main road. Some spaces may not be exposed. Some spaces may be easy for patients to find. Some patients may be more difficult for patients to find. In those circumstances, you probably want to change the clause. Landlord is still going to want to have the right to relocate you. But instead of having the right to relocate you, absolutely, you should have the right to terminate the lease if you're not happy with the new location. Uh, or the, tent, the amount of rent should be adjusted appropriately if you're moved to a less visible location. Um, watch out for those clauses. They're often hidden on the 28th page of a 35-page lease agreement. And if you don't pay attention to it, you'll agree to that and landlord can move you around. Uh, uh, and because it's at their expense, landlords don't do it just willy-nilly. But they will do it when they are trying to consolidate space or expand a, a space for one tenant and need to move you someplace else. Uh, use of the premises. Usually this is pretty simple if you're going to use the space for a chiropractic practice. It should spell out that you're going to use the space for chiropractic practice or some kind of medical practice. If you plan to sublease uh, or provide massage therapy or other services beyond chiropractic, that needs to be included in the use of premises. Part of the reason you want to include that is you want to notify the landlord that you plan to use the space for those purposes. That brings the landlord's attention to it so that if they've given someone else an exclusive right, they can tell you that you can't use it for those purposes. Um, in addition, uh, pay attention to the zoning rules. Um, zoning rules vary quite a bit from city to city. Uh, make sure the zoning for the space you are about to lease is going to allow you to operate a chiropractic practice. If it's zoned for an industrial use, that may not be a permissible use. And no matter what the landlord says or what the landlord promises, if the city says you can't use the space for that purpose, you're not going to be able to get a certificate of occupancy to open your business. So keep in mind, you know, leases can be intimidating. It often feels like you don't have much bargaining power, and you don't, by the way. But you do have some bargaining power as a tenant. Uh, and it's frightening to sign such a large commitment. It may only be two or $3,000 a month, but if you start signing a three-year, four-year, or five-year lease, that amount of money becomes a very large amount of money, certainly much more than a car payment and sometimes even more than some mortgages. So look at the leases carefully. Don't let the landlord's leasing agent bully you. Take the time to read the lease. Make sure you understand the terms in it. Uh, make sure you agree to the terms in it. And if there are problems in it, negotiate those problems before you sign the lease rather than trying to negotiate those problems after you've signed the lease and after you've breached the lease agreement.